Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us on our fourth webinar on the role of inflammation in psychosis. Uh, my name is Giuliano Tomei, and I am one of the researcher assistant um, working on the PP2 and Synapse 2 studies. And I will be chairing today's webinar together with my colleague, Danielle Smith, who's going to chair the Q&A session. Um, before we start with today's presentation, um, just to remind you a few instructions about the structure of our webinars. So we will have an initial 20 minutes presentation um, followed by a 10 minute session for questions and answers. As you might have noticed, all attendees in this meeting are muted to avoid background noises. So please feel free to use the Zoom chat uh, during the presentation to submit your questions, which will be read at the end of the webinar. Um, should we not manage to answer all your questions in time, um, we will then circulate the document with all the questions, including those that were answered and those that didn't, um, and the answers provided by today's presenter, and we will distribute it to you by email. Uh, this video is being recorded and will be uploaded on our YouTube channel where it will be freely available for you to view again and share with your colleagues. Uh, so um, without further ado, I'm pleased to introduce um, today's speaker, Professor Eileen Joyce, Professor of Neuropsychiatry at UCL and consultant neuropsychiatrist at the National Hospital for Neurology and Neurosurgery in London, who will give a presentation titled The Role of Inflammation in First Epidote Psychosis Cognitive Impairment. Um, so, Professor Elian, um, Thank you very you. much, everybody, for joining and inviting me. Um, what I want to do today is spend the first half of the 20 minutes uh, just talking to you about cognitive impairment in schizophrenia because it tends to be an area that people um, are not comfortable with or it's not really been highlighted enough, especially in clinical practice and then talk the last part, the possible involvement of neuroinflammation in cognition and schizophrenia. So this is my first slide. So I think most of you will, really, will understand and appreciate that schizophrenia is a brain disorder. It has a neurodevelopment origin with genetic predisposition and coupled with environmental influences during early life leading to the onset of psychotic symptoms, which are thought to be mediated through neurotransmitter dysfunctions, namely dopamine, but also as well as uh, the psychotic symptoms, there are cognitive impairments and negative symptoms, which are thought to be mediated through structural brain abnormalities in the white matter and the cortical gray matter. So essentially what, we're, what we know is that after birth, there is a long pre prodrome, if you like, or preamble up to late teens, early, um, early adulthood, when the psychotic symptoms emerge, preceded by a short prodromal period. After psychosis onset, there are early intervention teams which try and prevent relapse. And then ultimately, the long term outcome will depend on how you do in the first two years after the psychosis onset. Because if you remain symptomatic with poor social function after two years of early intervention, that will not change over the following decades. And then we're left with treatment consisting of rehabilitation and op optimization of function. So, this is not, okay. So, um, this is not the same time as things have happened, but never mind, don't worry. So um, the um, cognitive impairment, as I said, is something that is not really uh, flagged up in clinical practice. But we know that from research, that cognitive impairment is extremely common. And what we mean by cognition is not the kind of thinking processes um, normally thought of in something like cognitive behaviour therapy, but the kind of cognitive process that uh, are acquired through learning and will include memory, um, executive function, attentional function, 
Of course, in the Synapse 2 study, we're going to be looking at cognition before and after treatment using the brief back subtests, um, which have been developed to be studied in schizophrenia. And this is just to show you the subtests of the back, um, consisting of verbal memory, digit sequencing, executive functions of uh, tokens, um, learning, uh, symbol coding, Tower of London, and then you can get a composite score comprised of the performance in all of these. Now we see in patients with chronic established schizophrenia that they are impaired on every single subtest compared to healthy control mean. So the healthy control mean is set across this slide here, and this is the group performance of patients with schizophrenia. And you see that they're impaired between one and 1.5 standard deviations below healthy control mean, showing that patients with schizophrenia have generalized cognitive impairment affecting many different uh, cognitive functions. So this is a study taken from our uh, first episode study, which Isabel was involved in, which actually shows the same thing, but that cognition is impaired at psychosis onset. The previous studies have looked at established schizophrenia, and this is um, first episode psychosis. So we use the Cantab factory, looking at a whole range of cognitive tests from memory to executive function. And as you can see, they're impaired compared to the normal controls on every single measure. We know that there seems to be um, a generalized impairment because their full scale IQ was impaired. And we know that there's something happened between their pre-morbid cognitive function and their onset of uh, psychosis because their pre-morbid IQ, the test here using the naught, is actually much less impaired compared to the normal control. So something may be happening over the transition to psychosis causing a further detriment in cognitive function. After onset, cognitive impairment doesn't change. So this is our own study again, showing that if you look at symptoms um, from baseline, one year to four years, there's an improvement in negative symptoms, positive symptoms, and disorganization symptoms with treatment. But if you look at the different cognitive functions, IQ, memory, and working memory, there's no change. So this shows us that although symptoms can improve with treatment, cognition is impaired at the onset of the illness, and doesn't improve. So cognition is not a reflection of symptoms, it seems to be an independent factor. We also know that poor global cognition will predict poor social function. This is again taken from our study where we looked at IQ at three years and at the onset of their illness and various other forms of cognitive function and we showed that both at baseline and three years later, poor cognitive performance was related to overall social function score and whether they were able to get a job or not. So it seems that cognition is really important in the outcome of our patients. This has also been shown by a different study from the USA this time in patients with chronic schizophrenia when they looked at what is it about having a schizophrenia illness that may um, impede return to work or return to full-time education? And they found that of all the different types of symptoms, um, that it was the cognitive factor, the combination of attention, working memory, verbal memory and processing speed that predicted most of the variance in being able to return to work or school. So over and above um, residual symptoms, how you were pre it looks like cognition is the most important factor in predicting um, being able to function and return to work or back to full-time education. So cognitive impairment is present at onset. So when does it develop? So this is a study which Peter Jones was involved in where it looked at a whole host of so-called um, cohort studies, which have been following children from infancy right through life, really as um, 
not necessarily for mental health problems, but for lots of it, to see what, what determines health in adulthood. And um, many of these studies were able to look at cognitive function throughout the life of these children. And then you're able to look at them in adulthood through patient electronic records and see which of that cohort of children developed a mental illness, namely uh, schizophrenia and other forms of mental illness. So this study by Woodbury looked at all of these different so-called cohort studies, um, grouped in, in terms of quality, to find out um, what it is during childhood that may differentiate the people who went on to develop schizophrenia from their healthy uh, counterpart in school and in growing up. And they found that all of these studies showed that cognition was impaired between, at about an effect size of 0.5 of a deviation in those um, people, children who went on to develop schizophrenia. So it looks as if we can detect impaired cognition in those destined to develop a psychotic illness from an early age. And this may be present throughout their early development until eventually they develop a psychotic illness. This is um, uh, taken from one of, again, Peter Jones's studies. And um, it takes the best of these cohort studies and it looks at the risk of cognition for development of schizophrenia. And what they've shown in this graph is that taking all these studies together, this is the best example, that um, as IQ is uh, improved, your risk for the development of schizophrenia is lower. In other words, there seems to be this absolute risk of cognitive function during childhood and the development of psychosis later life. And the more cognitively impaired you are as you're developing, the more risk you have for developing a psychotic illness. And this is a study again, which actually shows that this risk includes not only absolute development of a psychotic illness, but the age of onset. So the more cognitively impaired you are, the more at risk you are of an early in onset of psychosis, which we know is predictive of a poor outcome. So there seems to be cognitive impairment in a subset of people who go on to develop schizophrenia throughout their life. But does the does cognition change at all again before psychosis onset? So this is taken from the Dunedin Longitudinal Cohort Study, which looked at children every five years as they were growing up. And once they reached adulthood, they could look at the effect of different factors during development on uh, adult mental illness. So they looked at IQ in childhood and adulthood this is their healthy group of over 500 people who they studied and they show here that their IQ is in the normal range in general and it hasn't changed during adulthood. Interestingly, they also show that those who developed a persistent depressive disorder in adulthood had a lower IQ than their healthy counterparts and this didn't change in adulthood. So it looks as if low cognitive performance during childhood is a risk factor of other forms of mental illness than schizophrenia. But this is the schizophrenia cohort um, and what they found that in childhood their IQ was much more impaired compared to healthy controls and those who would go on to develop depression, so it's much more severe for schizophrenia. And furthermore, by the time they reach adulthood, there seems to be a, a further effect, a further detriment of cognition. And this just shows the time course of their study, looking at children at 7, 9, 11, and 13, and in adulthood. And if you can see here, that is schizophrenia. The children who were going to go on to get schizophrenia had lower IQ from the age of 7. But something also happened during adolescence after the age of 13 to cause a further decrement during adolescence. In the study that we were involved in with Isabel, we've also found something 
um, about this decrement in cognition um, before the onset of uh, psychosis. This is our patients, which we divided up to um, look at their IQ at baseline, one year follow-up, three years follow-up, compared to their estimated pre-morbid level. And we found that, in, that compared to control, there was a subgroup of patients who had a normal IQ prior to psychosis onset, and this uh, IQ didn't change. We also found a subgroup who had a low IQ prior to onset, and this didn't change. But then there was this subgroup here who had a normal uh, IQ prior to the onset of psychosis onset, but there was a decrement by the time they transitioned to psychosis, and thereafter their cognitive performance didn't change, didn't improve. So this then suggests that we have a group with impaired cognition throughout their life, and something is happening around the transition to psychosis, causing a further cognitive decrement in some patients. This um, finding has consequences for long-term outcome. So we found that in the group that had a low IQ or whose IQ had deteriorated over the transition, their length of admission to hospital with their first episode was much longer than those who had the preserved normal IQ. At three years, the deteriorated no IQ group um, had less chance of getting re-employed. And then in terms of their symptoms, the deteriorated and low IQ had more core negative symptoms than this group who had preserved IQ. So as well as the group who had um, a long, long standing poor IQ, this group that deteriorated has also um, poor risk factors for a, um, a poorer outcome at three years along the line. So this suggests then that we're building up a model where there is impaired cognition throughout life in a subgroup, that just before psychosis onset, there's a further uh, cognitive decrement, and together these two factors will be linked to poorer outcome later in the course of their illness. What might explain this? Well, we don't really know, but there's some evidence that there is some sort of cognitive shrinkage occurring over the transition to psychosis. So several studies have shown this, but this is the study which I think shows this quite nicely, an Australian study, where they took people who they thought might develop psychosis, people in the prodromal period, they did MRI scans then and then several years later, and they looked at the difference in cortical volume in those people who converted to psychosis and in those who didn't convert. And they show the differences in cortical volume um, in the non-converters and the converters. Um, seen here is color map. And then they subtracted the two groups to find out where the differences lie. And this shows you where the volumes have shrunken in the people that have converted to psychosis. And you can see that there's widespread cortical volume shrinkage focused mainly on the frontal cortex. And in terms of what we know about the pathology of schizophrenia, we think that this might resent, uh, represent the so-called pruning of the cortical neuropil. So this is um, a cartoon of the normal cerebral cortex divided into its six layers, showing these pyramidal cells, which are the cells which contact with each other and to the rest of the brain through their long synapses, and they contact through these synaptic structures called the neuropil. In, in normal health, uh, when our brain is developing, there is an overabundance of co connections between different cells in the cortex. And for all of us, as we go through life, go through our teenage and early adult life, there is a pruning back of these connections to perform the mature brain. And what this, this thought in schizophrenia is this pruning of these cortical connections is overzealous, it's hyper pruning so that there is reduced 
connections between cellular elements within the cortex. Well, we know that lack of input into cells causes a shrinkage of the cell body itself. So what seems to be happening is that these cells are not dying off, but they become shrunkage, shrunken, and the cortex becomes diminished in size because of this. So this is the kind of cortical shrinkage that is common to be seen in people with schizophrenia. So turning to um, inflammation, we know that there already that there are several in environmental risk factors that interact with genes to promote the development of psychosis, such as malnutrition in early life in the fetus, um, lack of blood supply to the brain during birth, being brought up in a city, and cannabis abuse. So can inflammation constitute an environmental risk, as well as these other known factors? Well, there are several markers of neuroinflammation that have been studied in patients with schizophrenia, both before and the onset of their psychosis. I'm sure you know, but the markers of inflammation include the erythrocyte sedimentation rate, ESR, C-reactive protein, CRP, and cytokines such as IL-6 and TNF. These are all the acute inflammatory response to infection, but it's beginning to look that in some people, after the uh, infection dies away, they may have a more chronic low-grade inflammation um, exemplified by low levels but higher than normal levels of these inflammatory markers. So what do we know about the role of inflammation and cognition in schizophrenia? We know that low-grade inflammation can influence cognitive function across the life course in healthy populations but also in schizophrenia. This is a study by Dickerson in 430 patients with chronic schizophrenia who found that a higher CRP of greater than 5 compared to a lower CRP of less than 5 had this, this subgroup had significantly lower cognitive scores on their measure called the ray band but it did not affect presence of symptoms so it's looking as if the CRP may be a specific marker of cognition in patients with schizophrenia. This is another study of over 300 patients with chronic long-standing schizophrenia who were tested. They found that they had abnormally high CRP levels in 104 patients. And this was associated with impairment in IQ and abstract reasoning shown by this graph here. So the ones with the abnormal CRP levels had worse than the others in uh, IQ, abstract thinking, and process and speed just missed significant levels. So there's a link then people with uh, long-standing schizophrenia, their cognitive function, and their levels of low-grade um, inflammation. This is a recent meta-analysis of all of the studies that looked at that. And you can see that compared to zero risk, the, all of them have shown that there is an increased level of neuro-elevated CRP levels um, in all of the patient groups that have been studied. So this study concluded that elevated markers of low-grade uh, inflammation are modestly related to cognitive impairment in people with schizophrenia. So what do we know about the uh, effect of low-grade inflammation before the onset of psychosis. Sorry, this is this um, slide has become corrupted again, but I'll, I'll talk you through it. So this is the Kandekar study. Again, I think Peter Jones was a, um, a co-author on that. And this looked at the longitudinal study, the Avon or Alspac cohort of children who were affected every five years. What they found was elevated markers of low-grade infection in childhood and adolescence. And this was associated with increased risk of the development of psychosis or schizophrenia in adulthood. So it's looking now that um, uh, low-grade inflammation can be picked up in childhood 
And this is one of the risk factors for developing psychosis later in life. This study um, looked again at this longitudinal uh, cohort and found that it's not the infective load in childhood that is a risk factor for psychosis, but it's the higher CRP levels, markers of low-grade infection that was associated with lower IQ in this cohort. And they found some evidence that these elevated inflammatory markers may be harmful for intellectual development in these children. And this other study here, the Kappelman study, which is not looking at the alpha cohort, but looking at young people who were conscripted into the army, over nearly 700 young people. Um, and they showed that a higher ESR was associated with a lower IQ in a dose response fashion. When they looked at them later on, after they'd been conscripted into the army and became adults, that this higher ESR was associated with an increased risk of them developing schizophrenia and that the IQ partly mediated the link between inflammation and the onset of psychosis. So we're building up an idea that inflammation in early life may not only increase the risk of schizophrenia, but it may do so by affecting the neurodevelopment drug processing, um, giving rise to cognitive function. So it's possible then inflammation at an early stage is causing some neurodevelopmental abnormality affecting cognitive function and increasing the risk of psychosis. This is the study from, this is their study showing up in schizophrenia. The higher the ESR, the greater the risk of developing schizophrenia. So this is the model that we're building up. So we know that genes can give rise to impaired cognition throughout life, probably interacting with these known environmental risk factors, and then possibly an additional environmental risk factor that's just coming, being shown, is chronic persistent neuroinflammation. So what might be explaining then this cognitive decrement that we also see in a subset of patients during the transition to psychosis? Well, here we're in the realms of speculation here, but one possibility is that this is autoantibody-mediated psychosis. At least a subset of the patients and both patients that we are studying with early psychosis. What do we know about the effect of, for example, anti-NMDA receptor encephalitis on cognition? Well, these are two studies from SPINK, which has shown that in patients who have recovered from NMDA receptor encephalitis, there is a substantial persistent cognitive impairment observed in eight of the nine patients that they studied in 2011. So although these seem to have recovered, they had persistent cognitive impairment. And these were in the realms of executive functions and memory. And what they also showed importantly is those who were treated early with immunotherapy performed significantly better on their cognitive tests. And the most severe deficits were observed with inefficient or delayed initial treatment. When they looked at a group, bigger group of their patients, 40 patients, later on in 2015, they found that the majority of patients having recovered from encephalitis had normal MRI scans but had cognitive impairment. And when they looked in more detail at more sophisticated MRIs, they actually show that this is not the case. MRIs were not normal. They showed hippocampal volumes were significantly shrunken. They then found out that the integrity of the hippocampus at the microstructural level was impaired on both sides in these patients, and that this volumetric decrease and the impaired integrity of the structure correlated with memory performance and duration of illness in those patients. 
So it looked as if the Michael structure, uh, hippocampal impairment mediated the effect of the disease severity on cognitive function. Now, of course, these are patients who didn't go on to develop schizophrenia. These are patients with the kind of NMDA receptor encephalitis that we see in new, new neurological services. But nevertheless, it demonstrates that this can produce harmful, persistent effects on cognition associated with uh, structural deficits in the medial temporal lobe and to get the immunotherapy in quickly enough, they become less impaired than their counterparts who have delayed immune therapy. So I think this is a lesson for our sign up study and how important it is. Um, and I think time will tell whether the cognitive detriment that we see at the onset of psychosis can be related to autoantibodies and whether this can be treated or improved upon following the treatment. And hopefully we will have enough signal in our data to be able to test that out. So finished, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Joyce, for this um, very interesting presentation. So um, since we're a bit constricted on time, I'm going to pass um, the, the, the lead to my colleague, uh, Danielle, who will be leading uh, the question and answer session. Brilliant. Thank you, Juliana. Thanks, Eileen. It's really interesting uh, to learn about how yeah, cogn cognition is kind of related to symptoms in some way, but it's also it's kind of own independent category um yeah really interesting that that kind of cognitive impairment didn't improve even after four years or yeah, that applied. um just thinking about treatment options then we've got a couple of questions um from some members of the team so isabel's asked has cognitive remediation therapy in people with schizophrenia resulted in improved cognition yes that's a very good question um i think uh in patients with more long-standing schizophrenia, cognitive remediation therapy, which is a psychological therapy, has shown sustained improvement um, with a, an effect size of about 0.4 and about 0.5. Now I'm involved in uh, the Eclipse study in which we're looking at cognitive remediation therapy in people with early onset, first onset psychosis, just finishing collecting our data. And what we're trying to ascertain is whether a, the CRT improved cognition early on, and whether that is the kind of therapy that can be introduced into early intervention services. Because at the moment, when patients present with psychosis, cognitive impairment is a bit of an elephant in the room. It's not really addressed. Patients not discussed with the patients. Um, it's, people sort of work scared about it in case it really put the patients off and get them upset to think that they have cognitive impairment. But we've already done a previous study to suggest that no, if they want to know about it uh, because it explains a lot of the things that they are able to do very early in, in psychotic illness. Brilliant. So Eileen. Hopefully we'll know next year. <laughs> yeah, fantastic. Um, so specific to synapse 2 as well, what kind of cognitive outcomes would we expect if the kind of the psychosis in synapse 2 patients is caused by antibodies? Yeah, so the, you're doing the backs, which is, which comes with a lot of um, different uh, kind of cognitive functions. So I think in general, what you might see is a, a generalised improvement across the board. So that would be reflected in the competence score. But one of the things that we're particularly interested in is processing speed, because we know that of all the different cognitive tests that you can give somebody. The schizophrenia, so there's been hundreds and thousands across the world. Uh, processing speed, slowness of thinking with inf uh, information processing is the one that's most significantly affected in schizophrenia. So that's another one to look for following the treatment in the sign up study to whether it be great or an improvement in processing speed. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Eileen. Um, probably the last question now, um, just for time. Uh, a question saying, I was interested to see chronic stress and trauma not featured in environmental risk factors. Uh, yeah, that is a good point. Yeah, how much do you think developmental stress could account for low-grade inflammation and problems with cognition in adolescence? Well, I think that will come through the data. 
Um, if you read some of the papers, but, I mean, we don't know what causes this low level of inflammation in young people, which is a risk factor for schizophrenia, but um, the role of stress is being muted. So exactly right. It's possible that early trauma, early stressful events somehow can allow the abnormal neuro inflammatory process to continue. Don't know why that might be, but I think that's something that's going to be looked at in the future and may, and may come out. Um, I'm not sure if people are going to talk anything about that, but of course, trauma and stress are, are important yeah. as a risk factor. And, I, and you're right, I didn't put that in my slide, and I will do in future slides. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Ali. Right, last one, actually. We've just had a, a question come through. Um, I think it's from yeah, Marlene Kelbrick. Uh, she said cognitive impairment is often not highlighted in people presenting with first episode psychosis. One of the difficulties seems to be clearly identifying the, the impairments, some subtle uh, and some more prominent. Is there a user friendly tool that can be used to identify these and help guide management? Very good point. Well, we've got a user friendly leaflet that we developed for patients, their families, and care and um, and staff, which goes through all the kind of common impairments that you might uh, expect to see in first episode. Um, that's passed through the ethics committee, but we haven't released it yet until we find out whether it's been acceptable in our current CRT study. It's not a test; it's just a leaflet to explain the kind of um, impairment that they may experience and to help help families <coughs> understand why their loved one might not be able to do the things that they used to be able to do. In terms of um, how to test for this, well, well we're using CANTAB which is quite a long process so I think in the future we'll be looking at some of the subtests that suggest that there's a briefer way of doing it but I think you know, you're using the back, which I think takes about 30 minutes, isn't it, to uh, It's difficult to get a good um, measure of cognitive function beyond about 30 minutes, I'm afraid. But you never know. But our, our study may come up with some particular ones that can be used that are quicker. Brilliant. Thanks, Aline. I'll pass back to Giuliano now just for um, closing up our webinar. Uh, thank you very much, Danielle. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Joyce, for uh, answering these very interesting questions. Uh, so we've reached today's event we uh, the, the end of today's webinar. Um, thank you, everyone, for attending. Um, we hope you enjoyed it. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, in, uh, you will briefly receive an email with uh, the rest of the questions which were submitted and we didn't, unfortunately, have the time to answer. Uh, together, we, you will also find uh, a feedback form, which we will be very grateful if you could complete, and the link to our YouTube, uh, our YouTube channel, where this webinar will be uploaded, and you can also find the ones um, that aired previously. So on behalf of the Senate group, uh, Senate group, we thank you for joining us today, and um, we hope you enjoyed it, and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you.